I'll tell you an interesting story that um, when I was pastoring my first church, we had a baptismal that um, had, oh, it was about this high and it was to the left of the pulpit. And as I was uh, speaking for a worship service, I noticed that the people on this side, we had a baptism that day, the people on this side were paying rapt attention. They were loving my sermon. And the people over here weren't. And then right toward the end of the sermon, right about where you're sitting, I heard a mom lean over to her child and say, don't worry, honey, I think he's almost over. <laughs> so I thought, what was that about? I was it that bad? And then I noticed that the water, the, play, the drain must have been plugged and the deacons had left the water on and the water was about that far from the top of the glass at the end of my sermon. And of course, then we were able to run down and turn the water off, but as people were leaving, they were saying, oh, I'm sure glad you stopped when you did, Pastor, because I thought we were all gonna be baptized for a while. So that was pretty wild, so. All right, uh, there are so many good scriptures in this chapter that I chose Philippians, uh, for the, the sermon today. But you can see, instead of going through all 20, I left a few verses out. But it's uh, really good. And um, so we'll follow along on the screen. One of my favorites is in New Living Translation. Are you acquainted with that one? Uh, the background in, <laughs> this will date me, but in the 70s, the Living Bible came out. Um, late 60s, early 70s, and it was written by a grandpa for his children. It was just meant for devotional reading at home, so it was a paraphrase, it wasn't a translation. But it was so popular that uh, eventually translators took it and then made sure it matched, you know, what the original meaning was, um, and not just one person's uh, opinion. So it talks more like we talk today, and yet it is now a translation, so I love that about it. So just a, a little review from last week. I was thrilled when I saw this come up because I knew that my subject was joy. Notice in the Romans 15 that she used last week this verse. And do you remember what it was about last week? Hope. Hope. So, and hope is in there. But you'll notice I bolded mine. May the God of hope fill you with what? Joy. All joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the, the source is the Holy Spirit. And notice what he gives us. The God of hope fills us with joy and peace. Hope, joy, and peace all in this one verse. And I think that's pretty neat. We'll try it again. All right. So a little bit of the uh, history, which um, I've, I've learned so much from uh, Annette, and so I just took the way she does her slides and worked it into mine, so <laughs> I won't shake you up too bad, but I, I like how she always gives a little history of the book. Philippians was written by Paul, so it's a letter to who? The people that lived in Philippi, and because they lived in Philippi, we call them Philippians, <laughs> okay? All right, and named after one of the uh, important people in government. Probably his name was Philip. Philip. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're so good. This is good. <laughs> Scholars believe that Paul was in prison at the time, or at least in house custody, when this um, book or this letter was written to the Philippians. He addressed it to Epaphroditus. Uh, his friend, we don't know how a lot about him, of his upcoming sentence in Rome and of his optimism in the face of death. So I, I think by putting this in context, you have to realize that this is a letter that Paul is sending probably to an elder or somebody that, you know, led out in the worship at Philippi. And it's amazing to me that he says the things that he does He's in prison. He's in custody, at least house arrest. I think he was so well behaved that uh, according to Book of Acts, he had quite a bit of freedom, 
although he had guards watching his every move because he was going to be sentenced, of course. So that's the background of the book. So now we're going to move on. And here's how he starts this chapter. Uh, Philippians is easy to read in one sitting. It's just four chapters, and so I'm zooming in on chapter four because it speaks of joy. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. So therefore usually implies what? We're, we're coming to the conclusion of the letter, right? So therefore, based on everything I've told you in the first three chapters, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and I long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy. So in this case, he's just thrilled talking about this group. They bring him joy and the crown I receive for my work. What a compliment. Um, he's evidently seen some stars in his crown because <laughs> of the results of the Philippians. Now we go to four and five that we read for our scripture, and I, I love it in New Living. Always be what? Joy. Full of joy in the Lord. And in case you missed it the first time, he says, and I say again, rejoice. rejoice. <laughs> wow. Full of joy. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. And then he gives us a little reminder. Remember what's going to take place soon? The Lord is coming soon. So I'm sure that's part of the source of his joy. The Philippians he is joyful about. And then... Anybody have any idea what John 10.10 10 says? And maybe he's referring to the words of Jesus. Jesus is talking, the whole chapter 10 is Jesus the good shepherd. And he's talking about what good shepherds do. And he said the thieves come in to destroy and to kill. But I come that you might have... What's the way? Joy. That you might have joy, and you know the end of the verse. Or eternal. And that you might have it more abundantly. Okay, so that's John 10 10. I'm coming that you might have life. You're right. <laughs> that you might have joy in life, we could add, and have it more abundantly. Paul's writing this from prison. So, I'm going to go back to that verse. Always be full of joy. What's the difference between joy and happiness? Are they synonyms? Are they the same? Joy lives in your heart. Joy lives in your heart. Um, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. <laughs> and, he, and here's my reasoning. And here's my memory hook. What you said about joy comes from within. That comes from the heart. It comes from the Lord. Because he's the one that says, I'm going to bring you life so that you can have, be full of joy and enjoy life. Here's my memory hook. Happiness is based on happenstance. So if the circumstances aren't so good, I'm pretty unhappy. I might be really ticked. But according to Paul, I can still have joy during the tough times. Now do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you remember, happiness is based on happenstance. happenstance. But joy comes from the Lord. We can have joy in the midst of trial. That's why Paul, although he's in prison, can say, just thinking of you folks brings me joy. And then he asks them, probably reminding them, they, they're better off than he is right now, and he's saying, rejoice. 
in the Lord always. Always be full of joy. And I say it again. Rejoice. Yes. So happiness is like asking the universe to show up for me. I mean, happiness. Say it a little louder. So for happiness, it has to be overtly shown. Like you have to see it upon the person, the happiness, in order for it to be, for them to be happy. Well, that's a good question for everybody else. Is happiness, do you have to be able to see it, whereas joy you might not necessarily see, but joy is there? How do you feel about that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, because it's happenstance. Right, because of happenstance. You know, someone piles into me on my way home tonight. Bad happenstance. <laughs> I'm not happy. Right. <laughs> and you won't show happiness. But, but I can still home, have joy when have I joy think at least I have a car. Right. Yeah. Someone else might not even have a car. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'd better move on. The preacher's getting too long-winded here. <laughs> Don't worry about anything. Easy for you to say, Paul, right? <laughs> Instead, do what? Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Wow, do I have a story for you. This just happened this week, and it brought joy to my heart. On Monday, this last Monday, I was paged to go to, by a nurse, to go to a room in the intensive care unit. The man has uh, multiple problems, one being congestive heart failure, and I think he has problems with his liver as well. And the doctor told the patient and the family that he did not have long to live and they were not handling that news very well. And so the nurse said, I think he could use a visit from the chaplain. So later that day, I went up to visit Alan, and he was in the room by himself. And I said, I understand you got some bad news today. He said, yeah. He was still tearful. So I began to share some promises with him, Bible promises. And uh, if you remind me uh, during lunch today, if you want a personalized copy of those promises, we'll, we'll have a sheet where you can put your name on. I'll, I'll get you one. Um, but I call it my battle plan. So, I mean, we had a wonderful conversation. I told him that despite the news, um, I like to share something that Pastor Merrill often says to people. God will heal you. We just don't know whether it's on this side or the other side. But God will heal you. And sometimes people are curious. This man was a Christian, so he, he loved the Lord. But the happenstance <laughs> was not good, so he wasn't very happy. And they cried a lot the first day, I guess, family and patient. The um, nurses had a hard time even knowing what to do because they were crying so much. Anyway, I had a wonderful session with him, and, and at the end I said, Alan, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. He kind of, really? I said, yeah. I'm going to leave this personalized promise sheet with you. And your homework is to read this every morning, every day, and claim those promises. So I'll give you an example. For God so loved Alan that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, no, I put Alan's name in there, that if Alan believes in him, he shall have everlasting life. I expected to be called a few days later as we said our final goodbyes, and he went to sleep for the last time. But instead, I noticed he'd moved out of ICU, and he was now in the Mother Joseph building, and he was up on the fourth floor. And I went up there, and here's a guy I hardly recognize, and he has this big smile on his face. And I had to hurry, because when I looked in the chart, he was scheduled to discharge that day, and I didn't want to miss him. <laughs> And he said, I get to go home. And then he's, and guess what I saw on his tray stand? His personal 
his personalized battle plan. He says, I've been reading that every day and claiming God's promises, and he's been so good to me. And this big smile on his face. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So we had a thank you prayer. Now, he may not have long in this life, but he has an extension, and he goes home full of joy because of how good the Lord was to him. Wow. Then I leave the room wondering who's more helped or more <laughs> blessed. Is it the chaplain or is it the patient? We were more than happy. We were joyful, okay? Verse 7, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. The peace that passeth understanding, if you're acquainted with that. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Jesus. Sounds like a good battle plan for me. If I'm in danger of straying or wandering, his peace will guard me. Verse 8, and now, dear brothers and sisters, <laughs> you can tell he's beginning to wrap this up several times. Have you had... In conclusion, you know, speakers say that several times. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. This is good, too. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So I kind of get the idea that if we direct our thoughts this way, we're going to have the joy of the Lord. If we only listen to the news and what's going on, <laughs> happenstance is getting worse and worse, isn't it? I mean, every day, it's just awful. Keep, now, how many of us can say this? This is a pretty bold statement. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Wow, that's a pretty big assignment. How many of us can say, use me for a ro role model? <laughs> eh, I don't think so. But um, Paul, you know his story, how he was knocked off his horse by the bright light and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was cleaning up the church by killing all the Christians. The Lord turned him around. It was powerful. And that's why it's so fun to read what he how I praise the Lord that you're concerned about me again. Now his thoughts go to the people living in Philippi. I know you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. <laughs> now 11 and 12. Not that I was ever in need. Now here's, here's another source of joy if you pick it up. For I have learned what? That's a good one for Christmas time, isn't it? <laughs> I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or on everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, <laughs> with plenty or little. You're not going to rob me of my joy, whether I have a whole lot or whether I have very little, whether I have clothes on my back, whether I have food in my tummy or not. Powerful words. Now, one of the best-known verses of Paul, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. That's one of the verses I have on that battle plan sheet. Even so, and what a compliment to the Philippians, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. I don't know whether they sent care packages or food or what, but evidently they were reaching out to Paul. At the moment... <laughs> I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. So Epaphroditus brought the gifts, and then Paul says, before you head home, I'm going to write a letter, and I want you to take it home and read it to your home church. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. What a neat thank you, huh? And this same God who takes care of me, oh, this is a powerful one, will do what? You and, you and, and me 
You and I, which you and I can get in on this too. I as a subject. <laughs> By the way, my dad gave me a little hint. He said, take out yourself and say it. And if it doesn't sound right, then I is wrong. So, uh, in other words, a lot of people say the Lord is good to you and I. I mean, take out the other person. The Lord is good to I. Mm -mm. So then you know to use me. Little tip. Okay. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. And then he can't help but express his joy. Now all glory to God our, for, our Father forever and ever. Amen. End of chapter. End of book. So some key points, some key points. And I brought a little help. I'm gonna, um, if I can find those sheets. I told uh, Gary my clue is when Annette shuffles the paper, I know that I'd better have the next slide ready. <laughs> but the remote's working, so I think we're good, Gary. This is, this is pretty amazing. So, have you ever thought that joy is a choice? I can choose what kind of day I'm gonna have. And you know what I've discovered working in the hospital? Whether I feel like it or not, if I put a smile on my face and I thank that housekeeper, housekeeper's role's pretty important, especially down in the emergency room where they're, they're changing rooms so fast and they have to have it ready for the next trauma or code and they don't have very long. I tell them, I could just imagine if I'm a patient and I'm coming into a room that you've just finished and that bed looks perfect and everything is clean, I'm, gonna, I'm not feeling good. That's why I'm in the hospital. That little thing is going to make me feel so much better. Your role is very important. And I don't know if you've heard this, but people decide how well airlines are taking care of their engines by how clean the trays are in the back of the seat. You know why? They figure if they can't even keep the trays clean, how do I know they're taking care of the engine? <laughs> so you see that role is very important, whether it's, you know, and every role uh, in every job is important. Um, joy is a choice. Ooh, this is a good one. Joy is trusting when you want to doubt. Wow. Isaiah says, trust in the Lord forever because in Yah, the Lord is an everlasting rock. As Christ followers, we aren't pressured to do it all for everyone. We trust in Jesus to do the heavy lifting. The key is trust. We just need to have Mary's response since we're talking about Christmas. When she's told she's going to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit, she's really scratching her head. She says, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be done according to your word. That's trust. So joy is trusting when you want to doubt. Joy is receiving when you want to reject. Well, what, what do we mean by that? So here's an interesting thought. Can you imagine how the innkeeper would have felt if he said to Mary and Joseph, of course you can't stay in that stable. That's for paying customers. Who do you take me for? But instead, we find joy in making room for people in need. Listen to these words from Hebrews. Don't neglect to show hospitality, for by so doing... Some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. You know the, um, the legend of the, the story of sometimes it's a tailor and sometimes it's a cobbler, depending which version you read, that he's praying that the Lord will come and visit him, come to his shop that day. You remember that story? Three different people come with different problems and he shoes them away because he doesn't want them to interrupt the, <laughs> the coming of the Lord. And then he's so disappointed that night when the Lord isn't there. You promised you'd be here all day. 
What did the Lord tell him? I came three times and you sent me away. <laughs> now here's an interesting story. I was with a bunch of young people and I was thinking as they left for their, their class, I was with a bunch of young people and we were going to act out this story for our church service. When a homeless guy came, actually came in the back of the room and he's sitting there watching that and I'm thinking, oh man, Lord's really putting us to the test. <laughs> Keep practicing, kids. But I have a real need back there. Fortunately, it was a church that had a food and clothing bank like this, and I could actually take and help the man. I said, if you, I'll be right with you, but we're working on this play, and it's, it's like, wow. <laughs> this is for real. This isn't just games. It isn't just for show next week. So, um, And then... I thought this was so good. Joy is celebrating when you want to fear. Deep thoughts. What's the first thing the angels say to mortals? And it's almost in every angel story. What do they say? Fear not. Do not be afraid. Do you know that that occurs over 365 times in the Bible? Enough for every day. I love this. Angels say, fear not. I can hear Jesus instruct his most trusted angels. He's about ready to send them to you. And he says, okay, let's go over this again. Most of the people I tell you to speak to will be scared out of their wits. <laughs> so let's practice this greeting one more time. And then the angels would all say in unison, fear not. Okay, so I love that. And I'm going to tag on one more um, how do we choose joy? Just some hints. Um, how do we choose joy? If it's a choice, how do we choose it? One, we can share. And I'll let you use your imaginations on how you can share. Um, by my sharing that, my battle plan with that gentleman, I have more joy <laughs> as a result. I get to share in his joy. I love this too. Encourage someone who's fearful or worried. Do you ever run into anybody like that? Yeah. Do you think Philippians 4 would help? I think so. This is interesting. When you're sitting there in your pity puddle, maybe it's time to get out your notepad, take an inventory of the things that bring you true joy. And um, then the final one, pray. Pray. Um, here's, here's Denny's paraphrase for a chapter earlier in this book, Philippians 2.13. In King James, it didn't make a whole lot of sense because it said to will and do of his good pleasure. So I, now I have a Denny paraphrase. For God is at work within you. That's each of us. God is at work within you, not only helping you to do what pleases him, but helping you to want to. Ooh, what more could he do? He's going to give me the strength to do what pleases him. And in addition, when I'm like a little kid, but I don't want to, he said, I'll even help you with that. And we're going to close with this prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow, you can help me, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, what? joy. Okay. And then we'll close with this uh, prayer that was part of that. Oh, divine master. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, and to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And I guess we could invite each of us particularly myself, and Lord, please give me joy and understanding for what it is. All right, we're ready for our closing song. <laughs>